are bugs that affect us that are too small to see, and then there are bugs that are so big we don't want to see them. But we all live together in the creepy, crawly world of spiders, mites, and bugs. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Buback with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Most of us have learned how the plague, or the Black Death, wiped out 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population during the 14th century, killing more than 400 million people. Although there has been some debate that the Black Death was from several epidemics of different diseases occurring at the same time, DNA analysis has recently proven that the vast majority was due almost completely to the plague bacterium, Yersinia pestis, which was carried in oriental rat fleas living on rats brought by the Silk Road from China reaching Europe in the middle 1300s. There are other important illnesses carried by invertebrates, that official name for what we commonly call the bugs. Mosquitoes carry diseases such as malaria and West Nile. Ticks carry Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever and this list goes on. Also bugs can be troublesome just by being bugs. For example, that itch and rash from gnats, chiggers, fleas, and mosquitoes, the pain of the fly bite, and the worry of bed bugs and lice. To help us understand this world from the bug point of view, we have Dr. Paul Johnson, research entomologist from South Dakota State University, whose research interests revolve around insect biology diversity. His current research is focused on beetles, and recently, as he has studied a new potential biofuel, he has rediscovered the switchgrass moth. To help us understand the world from the human point of view, we have Dr. Ken Walker, neurologist from Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia, who's filling in for our uh, family physician we had planned for the show tonight. Uh, but we asked Ken Walker to join us, and he said he can fill the bill. And so we're happy to have you, Ken, and we're happy to have you, Paul. Paul, tell us a little bit about um, what you, did I define it correctly? You're into the switchgrass uh, moths and all sorts of different things in your job. The, the all sorts of different things is a good way to characterize yeah. it at this point, yes. That's, and I have a bevy of students that are madly working on resolving the details of the moth's life cycle and its relationships to the switchgrass and hopefully we can save the world and keep our cars going. At the with, end. That, with that yeah. switchgrass that we're going to grow without being eaten. That would be the, nice, yes. Without the, and how devastating was that bug that was killing switchgrass? Well that's one of the things we're working on right now is, is trying to determine exactly uh, how uh, devastating it can be. Uh, uh, previously we thought the caterpillar of the moth was only feeding on the, uh, to the tillers, the above ground growth yeah. of the grass and, and was producing oh, roughly 10 to 15 percent uh, biomass loss from any given plant. But just this last winter, my graduate student discovered that the caterpillar is active underground, feeding on the buds on the rhizome and is killing the, uh, the buds before they even grow. And so we're trying to calculate the, uh, you know, the theoretical potential biomass loss off of that. So. But pretty bad. It's pretty bad, yeah. So I mean, you know, so you're a you're a generalist, aren't you? You 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 do a lot about bugs. You know, I, w I went through graduate school like most people in the sciences, learning how to specialize in a certain area. Yeah. But as the years went on, I became more and more generalized again. Yeah. So it's sort of a throwback to childhood. Now I can play with lots of different things. Yeah. So that's great. 
Uh, and Ken, you're a neurologist, uh, but actually you're a teacher of general internists more than anything else. Right. And, and you know, you were, uh, you were my teacher when I was a junior medical school at, a medis medical student at Emory in, back in 73. And you dragged me into in internal medicine. It's all your fault. Uh, uh, and, but you make rounds as a neurologist uh, treating all sorts of different things. And so I think that uh, when I said, would you uh, jump in on this bug talk because we need somebody, and a lot of these diseases are encephalitis and meningitis and sort of neurologic things, and you said, sure. So thank you for taking this on. It's my pleasure. Actually, <clears throat> during the Vietnam War over in Vietnam, I spent as a physician most of my time taking care of several thousand malaria patients. Japanese B encephalitis, dengue, and all those odd bugs that one finds over in Southeast Asia that one doesn't find over here, thankfully. We have our own share of those. Yeah, the tropical illnesses, mostly mosquito uh, Mus vector? Mosquitoes, uh, amoebae too, but yeah. most of them are mosquitoes. And uh, so t tell us a little bit about uh, Emory. Uh, and you, Georgia and your, your whole story. I mean, you, you're a country boy from Georgia. Right. I used to have to, when I was a kid, have to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning, go out and milk the cows. You did that. It's a, a long way from that to talking about West Nile yeah. and Seth Lydas. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, so right now you're going to be highlighted in a, in a show that we'll be taping in two days. And we'll show in a, uh, we'll probably be appearing before this show, actually, uh, and uh, about international studies. So we'll talk about that on this other show, but right now we're going to, we're going to talk about bugs. So l let's start with um, encephalitis uh, and malaria and uh, mosquito encephalitis uh, illnesses. Let's say West Nile. Uh, what uh, pertinent issue about West Nile virus would you like to bring up? Or well, comment? from the entomological side, uh, uh, West Nile is transmitted by mosquitoes. And as uh, uh, most of us are aware now, it's, it's pretty much, a, or by and large, a bird disease uh, that uh, has moved over into affecting humans. And so, um, uh, particularly in the northern plains here, uh, we see it uh, showing up when uh, the Birds are, are fled, the young birds are fledging, starting to leave the nest. The mosquitoes have been active. Uh, they're moving uh, the virus back and forth amongst the bird populations. And then uh, as the bird populations change this summer, then uh, those mosquitoes are also looking for alternative flood supplies. And, and we're uh, as tasty to, to those female mosquitoes that are needing those proteins to uh, uh, produce their eggs. To, uh, uh, as they move over to us, then uh, they also vector the virus into us. So, and it's the virus uh, that is in the saliva of the mosquito. Yes, yeah. Uh, now, I mean, uh, we know that uh, AIDS is a bloodborne illness uh, that is uh, spread uh, with blood, but not spread by mosquito. Could you explain that? My understanding on that is, is that the uh, AIDS virus gets digested. Uh, by the mosquitoes, right. and, and it stays in the alimentary tract, does not move into the salivary glands. Uh, most mosquitoes don't regurgitate uh, blood from a previous meal when they feed, and so most things that, most disease organisms that are vectored by mosquitoes uh, are passed through uh, when they inject saliva as they're piercing the skin, uh, and uh, uh, injecting uh, anticoagulants and the various enzymes that cause the allergic response, and. Uh, and, and break up the tissues. And so it's that that's mosquito saliva that, that causes all that allergic reaction? That, that's, that, yes, yes. The, well, the enzymes that are in the saliva. And it yes. spreads certain viruses, but it doesn't spread AIDS because that, that is, doesn't infect the mosquito? That, that, correct, yeah. It, it, uh, if, when it enters the mosquito, it stays in the alimentary tract, uh, is digested out or at least uh, expelled when the uh, when the meal is, is uh, expelled out the anus. So it doesn't have a chance to then get back into the next host when the mosquito uh, visits the, the post-AIDS host. Uh, so, so we're really not threatened with mosquitoes with, for, for HIV or AIDS? No. no but, that, that, but we are threatened by other illnesses. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Ken, any, any comment about the West Nile encephalitis? What is an encephalitis, anyway? <clears throat> it's a, a fairly characteristic picture for several days the patient feels poorly, that things just aren't right. Uh, and then they begin complaining of headache. And then after five or six days, they often become confused and disoriented. And then in, a f in many cases, but not all cases of West Nile, they become comatose. They have respiratory difficulties. Uh, many of them recover. Some of them do not. But I think, as Paul will point out, <clears throat> that there are a significant number of people who are infected who never know it. So they, they're the subclinical disease. They just kind of feel lousy, and they call it it's a flu, and then they right. go there, run their course. Uh, do, we've seen a, a lessening of this uh, of West Nile virus in the U.S., right, or, or, or not? Well, it has spread all the way across the United States and Canada now, so it has made its transcontinental migration complete. Um, I don't know, Ken, that uh, my impression is, is that a lot of the apparent decline is both uh, uh, a matter of, of uh, a fewer new cases being found, but also less surveying being done. It, mm -hmm. would, what do you think about that? Something I'm really interested in that you can enlighten us about. In medicine, one of the things that's so important learning about people is their activities of daily living. Yeah. What time do they get up? What do they eat? And so forth. What about mosquitoes? When do they get up? When do they eat? What are their activities of daily life? Okay. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, question. actually, it is because you, there's uh, well, for example, we have forty-something species of mosquitoes in in the Dakotas. And Forty species of mosquitoes. And I think the last count was something like forty-three, somewhere around. It's you know, mid mid forties in do number they, of species. Do they Mo all do the same? I mean, they no, all no, no, no. That that was sort of the kind of the point here is that they all do different things. They all have little differences in activity periods, different times of the day, uh, the kinds of blood they feed them. Most of them are bird feeders. Some of them specialize in small mammals. Um, and so uh, you'll have different, uh, uh, diff different species of mosquitoes. Well, let, let's just take out the ones that will come after humans with the minority. Even that small group of about a half a dozen species has their uh, particular favorite times of day. Uh, and they're different. They and have they're different, different activities yeah, of daily yeah. living. There's some that prefer to be active in midday when it's warm, uh, uh, some that prefer to be in the evening when it's cool, uh, some late at night, some earlier you know, under different temperature regimes. So there's a lot of variation. Some prefer dense vegetation such as woodland, um, like densely planted gardens. Uh, others prefer grasslands. Um, and so. you know what, we need to talk about um, how to protect ourselves from these differently. I mean, you know, and we need to go there, but we need to do this first. In 1975, the small Connecticut village of Old Lyme became the center for the outbreak, what was first called Lyme arthritis. After years of investigation, the tick-borne Borrelia bacteria was identified as the cause of Lyme disease. He was running to the sprinkler on Labor Day weekend, and he came and sat on my lap, and on his left shoulder, I noticed a little brown dot. And I thought, well, he's never had a mole there before. So I touched it, and it was a bump. And then as I started looking at it, I realized it was a tiny little tick. Like if you hit your hand with a tip of a pen, that dot that it leaves, it was like that. Or the top of a pin. It was just tiny. And they said, well, one in 3,000 ticks carries Lyme disease. You probably don't need to worry about it. But I just had this gut feeling I have to get this checked out. I just, I just had this gut feeling. I just knew right away something was going to happen. And so the next, on Tuesday then, after Labor Day weekend, I made an appointment with Dr. Heeb, and he said protocol is to wait and watch, but he was glad that I had the tick saved. Um, and he told me what to watch for, the warning signs. And he said if it's going to happen any that if he was infected, it'll happen within 10 days, and nine days later, he was, um, all the symptoms that we were to watch for came true. Around the tick bite, which was on his shoulder, was a red bullseye, rings of, of red, and they were about four inches 
across when they were full. He had a really, really high temperature and his ears got really, really red and swollen. When I get a red bullseye, my ears swell up and my temperature is really high. We had been to northern Minnesota, so we don't know if it was picked up there. We'd also been to uh, a hunting lodge in South Dakota up by Clear Lake. So we don't know, maybe it happened to get picked up there. We were terrified. I mean, you hear the Lyme disease and you just think horror stories, and he wasn't even three. And I thought, oh, a lifetime of that, you know, just horrible. So um, he went on 10 days of very, very high doses of amoxicillin. Then um, we called a infectious disease doctor and... Dr. Holm, or Joni Holm, um, consulted and said that there should not be any side effects after because we caught it so quickly and because he was on the antibiotics. To find out that he tested positive for Lyme disease, we had a Western blot test okay. done on him. It was a blood draw, and then that was sent into a lab, and the name of the test was the Western blot, and that came back positive. So it still stays in his body. If he were tested at any time, he would always, he'll always test positive for having Lyme disease. He has the antibodies, and if he gets a case, it'll be a s lower dose, okay. like a lower effects, yeah, fewer side effects. Energy came back, and we had no trouble with fevers or any of his, and his ears, the swelling on his ears went back down. I think he was sore. He was achy. He didn't want to move, yeah. I think. You know, you kind of have to guess when it's a three-year-old, but yeah. it was low energy. Lyme disease is kind of a scary thing, but luckily we have good health care and we can be proactive. And to even though we don't have to always check for the deer ticks and the mouse ticks around here, to just be real diligent about it. Because I would have never guessed, you know, that it could happen here. So Lyme disease, that's a disease carried by a tick vector, but it's, it's an illness within the tick. Explain that a little bit more. Well, it does affect the, uh, the physiology of the tick. So when, it, it's, uh, uh, when, the, when the virus is inside the tick, it, it uh, affects its behavior the, a little bit. The tick is sick. It's the, a the, sick tick. Well, yeah, but it's hard to tell if it's a sick tick. And, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> that's a good... It, because a, you don't want to tick off a sick tick. You, <laughs> oh, that's a bad so. one. But let me ask you this. Uh, the, the ticks that carry Lyme disease are a deer tick that are yes. carried on deer mice, right? And we don't have them in South Dakota. The, the, the immatures of, of the larvae of, of the deer tick are on mice and voles and other little little animals, little animals little, the small mammals that are in the fields and in the woods. The adults uh, feed on white-tailed deer primarily or preferentially, but they'll be on other animals too. And they'll move over to humans, although um, uh, we don't seem to be a preferred blood uh, meal. Which for. is a nice thing. It's a nice thing, but, but uh, uh, you know, a lot of insects and, and other arthropods will bite us once, uh, you know, as an individual animal and then leave us alone. And, and um, deer but ticks are sort of like this. They, they'll move over to us, they'll take a bite, uh, dr take a little blood and... And then and, they'll go, uh, ick, Brussels sprouts. Uh, ah. it's, uh, it, it, ticky ick. One yeah, of those. Yeah, ticky yeah. ick. <laughs> Okay. So, so um, but, but we but, still But when they do that, then, then you have the, the, the transmission of that virus into our blood. And okay. And uh, Ken, do you want to uh, extrapolate about uh, the Lyme arthritis and the Lyme disease itself? <clears throat> it is a, a protein disease. That is, it can affect many different parts of the body. It's very hard to diagnose. Those of us who are not in endemic areas usually don't think of it. And occasionally we see patients who come from that. Uh, you can have arthritis, you can have various other systemic involvements in it. It's uh, very difficult to diagnose. Right. I know that you can have this particular type of rash, you know, kind of a target rash, and that uh, rash does not always happen. And they can end up later, you know, weeks, months later, didn't have a tick bite that they knew of. Like you say, it's a very tough diagnosis to make. Weird arthritis, as it was first made uh, in kids, a mom uh, was her kid and the kid neighbor kids and all these kids seemed to get this junior, uh, this uh, 
junior rheumatoid arthritis, this juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and they were calling that and except why am I, are we having an epidemic in this uh, part of, of uh, Connecticut? And so this was how it began. And, and uh, great story. It spread, and it's a lot of it in Minnesota and not much of it here. Am I right on that? Correct. And uh, the natural range of, of the tick, which is you know, the deer tick, Exodes scapularis, uh, basically comes up to the greater extent of the prairie, so where the eastern forests and the prairies start to meet. So central Minnesota, central Iowa, Missouri, right. uh, parts westward are, uh, are, are free, are of, free of the natural distribution of the tick. But now we've got our own tick that comes, I mean, we've got tons of ticks. I mean, you can walk through any yard and you have ticks. What kind of ticks do we oh, have? Oh, that, that's what oh. most people would call a dog tick, American yeah. dog tick or wood tick. Uh, it's a variety of common names in different parts of the country. Uh, and that's that, uh, you know, three, four, or five millimeter long uh, reddish brown tick with white markings that you'll find just about anywhere. Uh, they're already active this spring. Well, you know. I, now they say this is a really bad year for ticks. Have you heard that? Well, I think that's more prediction just because it's been dry and, and warm and they're coming out early. Um, I had one on me the other day, which surprised me because it's so early, but I've talked to a number of other people in the last uh, week that, uh, that have been seeing the ticks. And uh, those don't uh, vector uh, Lyme disease. What right. do they vector? Anything? Uh, Oh, oh yeah. yes, yes. Uh, the, the, they can be a vector of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, tularemia, uh, and uh, uh, tick paralysis. Right. Uh, or what's that neurological problem mm -hmm. that's called mm -hmm. tick paralysis, right. which I understand is a sort of a complex. It's a fascinating problem. So. problem. Uh, the, uh, the tick, I'm told, usually begins right at the back of the neck, and uh, there's an ascending paralysis uh, that. <clears throat> it's difficult to know exactly what it is. There are a number of ascending paralysis. And when, when you say ascending, meaning it's periphery begin, and then comes up. <clears throat> yes. And <clears throat> there are a number of causes of this that we can't do anything about. And it's a lucky individual that the physician suddenly looks in the back of his neck and sees this tick and plucks it off and he gets well. Yeah, I, I, have you ever seen that? I mean, I've heard about it, I've written it, you've seen it. Where I come from in Georgia, in North Georgia, there are a lot of these cases, and we occasionally see them down in Atlanta. Yeah. Right. A lot of the diagnostics about that refer to the tick having to be embedded for some hours, uh, so it has to have been uh, feeding, and it, it seems to be associated with gravid females that are already producing eggs, so there's something about uh, the egg production in that in that fertile female that seems to have something to do with 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 the production of whatever it is that causes the paralysis. The paralysis, so, yeah. and but so they have to be attached for some period of time. Yeah, so. to, to let out their neurotoxin, whatever it might be. Right, right. right. I had an interesting case of tularemia, and I didn't know it until the man was deathly ill, and he was admitted to our hospital, bad pneumonia. And uh, it was set the new year old uh, heavy smoker guy, so he had lung disease to start with. And I started with the standard antibiotics. This is 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And uh, he, he was failing. He was getting worse and worse and worse. And here's, you know, he's in his 70s, and, you know, you know, he shouldn't be dying, but he's dying. So I added genomycin, which is a powerful drug that I used, you know, used at the time as a backup. We, we commonly don't use it anymore, although it's still a very good drug. He stabilized. I mean, we had to put him on a breathing machine. He stabilized, and he was kind of hanging on, you know, and we were doing what we could to keep him alive in Brookings, South Dakota, in our intensive care unit. And the, call, the lab calls kind of panicking and said, this is about a week after this, and he's still alive. We found something that might be really bad, and so we've sent it off, and, and then it was sent off to somewhere else, and the CDC called and said, you know, well, we think you've got some tularemia mm -hmm. there. So it was tularemia pneumonia. Well, that's rare, and I mean, tularemia. I read everything I could read about tularemia, and <clears throat> glad I started the genomycin. It was the right drug to use, and so he's getting better. And I, you know, he's got a, he's on a, he's got a trach by this time. He's had this respirator for a long time, and he's maybe two, three weeks on the trach, and he can't talk well, uh, but he's written things, and he says nothing to do with rabbits, because most most of the tularemia is really spread to rabbits by ticks. Mm -hmm. It's kind of mm -hmm. a little off the topic. Yeah. So 
the long and the short of it is when he finally gets the tube out and he can talk with me, I said, you know, I, you said that you had nothing to do with rabbits. He says, no, I don't touch rabbits. I stay away from them. I see them in my yard, though, sometimes, mm -hmm. dead. You see them in your yard? Yeah, I see them when I'm mowing. When you're mowing, do you move the rabbit? or No, I run right over them. <laughs> Boom! Rabbit. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> a few years ago, I had a, a patient who had tularemia. Very sick, recovered. A year later, he came back with it again. It turned out his wife had dressed the rabbit and put it in the deep freeze, uh -huh. and none of us had thought to tell her to destroy the rabbit. Uh -huh. okay, so they cooked it a year later, and he got tularemia oh, once my. again. Well, tularemia is very much spread by ticks. And it has been reported in the MMWR, the, uh, the uh, CDC's bulletin, uh, in South Dakota, on the Indian Reservation, with little boys playing with the dogs mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. coming down with tularemia. It's a real yeah. pertinent disease related to these vectors which we're talking about. Right. And, and you know, it was named for Tulare County in California, mm -hmm. which yeah. is where it was first described. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, Let's talk about the mosquito again, because uh, now we've got, uh, I want to get back to it, because mosquitoes are really something that we all, you know, live with in this mm -hmm. darn state. I mean, our, you know, the only place that has bigger mosquitoes is northern Minnesota, I think. If you've ever been canoeing there, they can pick you up and carry you across the water. They're that strong and big. Um, Some of my friends in Alaska would... Would, would say that Alaska yeah. has bigger mosquitoes. <laughs> But a so, lot of them all spend the winters in Minnesota, so. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, educate us about the mosquitoes that we have in this state and what we need to do to prevent being bitten by them. Well, uh, all mosquitoes are associated with wet areas, not necessarily what we would consider wet lands, but, but wet areas. Some of them uh, require larger bodies of water with vegetation growing out of them uh, where the larvae uh, feed uh, in this, in the, still not necessarily stagnant but the still waters um, and out of reach of predators others will take very tiny amounts of of water you've you've probably heard about uh, um, the problem with 80s mosquitoes and yellow fever transmission around uh, tire uh, facilities because you get small amounts of water accumulating in, in vehicle tires um, uh, especially in the subtropical and tropical countries um, the Culex tarsalis mosquito, which is the common uh, West Nile virus vector around here, will uh, reproduce in just these thin sheets of water that are grown that are in the lawn or in farm fields. Just with there's no protecting. Growing. There's no way of no, getting. No, they're, they're all over the place, and with 40-something odd species here, you know, different habitats, different species, different times of the day of activity. Uh, so it's sort of nice that there's only a few species that will actually take human blood. But, uh, so, and it's the female, of course. And it's, only the female. Not the guy. I mean, we're, you know, the... Actually, the, the, the male mosquitoes are ecological wonders, and uh, they're very important pollinators. A lot of our native prairie plants, for example, and meadow plants are pollinated by mosquitoes. No kidding. Uh, it, they're good. They're, they're very good. And, and uh, every summer, I'd, I'd, I'd love to take pictures of this because the, the common milkweed yeah. is pollinated in part by mosquitoes. And I have pictures of them getting caught in the little parts of the flower because they're just, the, the flower grabs them and, and uh, the mosquito is not strong enough. But you can find the, the, the pollinia, the pollen uh, structures stuck to the mosquitoes and other flies. No, so the milkweed. Uh, traps the, the mosquito. I didn't know right, that. Right, right. And then there's, there's several species of, of wild orchids that are known to be pollinated only by mos male mosquitoes. Uh, so they, they do have their ecological function, but unfortunately the, the female side is, are, those are, those are, the, those are the bad those ones. Those are the blood suckers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what do we know about the phylogenetic or evolution of mosquitoes. Oh, that, nowadays, thanks to genomics, that is very well worked out, and, and uh, there's there's a lot of work still to be done. But uh, but we do know the relationship levels. One one of the things I find fascinating now is is now that they have the mosquito, mo much of the, the the main mosquito phylogenetics worked out, they're now mapping the diseases that they they vector, and so you can uh, trace the uh, the evolution of of different. Uh, 
uh, disease organisms and their association with, with, the mosquito. with the mosquitoes as they evolve through time. Phylogenetics. In this case, we're, we're combining the phylogenetics of the mosquitoes and the, the, the disease vectors and, and their hosts. Too, and so. Explain the word phylogenetics one more time. Phylogenetics is um, sort of the analytical part of uh, studying evolution. You're, you're in, nowadays, we're, we're using uh, gene sequences as part of it, but you're also using different uh, structures and behavioral patterns of the organisms. But you're, you're trained to uh, uh, determine the relationship patterns, which species are related to which. And, and as you go through the species and the genera and the families and the other groups, then you're, you're looking at those, those evolutionary patterns. And ph so phylogenetics is, is the analytical part of trying to unravel those, those evolutionary patterns. So. You, you know, what we can talk about coming up is bed bugs, we can talk about lice, head lice, we can talk about chiggers and gnats and spiders and flies and fleas. So we've got lots to cover when we get back. West Nile virus was first identified in 1937 in western Uganda. It appeared for the first time in the United States in 1999. Since then, it has spread across the country, even here in South Dakota. Kent Leibel says that it was six years ago, about a week before Labor Day, when he was bitten by a mosquito carrying West Nile virus. It was about a week or week and a half after la Labor Day that uh, actually came down with some severe symptoms that ultimately ended me up in the hospital. It felt like I was uh, getting chills and aches and, uh, and, and headaches, and it felt just like a typical flu bug. That's really what I thought I had, and kind of just you know, laid around and took a day or two off of work and, and kind of relaxed and thought I was getting better and went back to work and was feeling real good for two, three days. And then all of a sudden I uh, started to go downhill and get more severe headaches and more chills and it, it got severely worse. Libel isn't kidding when he says things got worse. He was taken to the hospital, checked over and sent home to recuperate. Blood was drawn to test for West Nile, but at the time, this blood test took a few days, so results didn't come back right away. Luckily, my attending uh, physician uh, called me the next day just to follow me up on a Saturday morning, and because uh, I didn't look so good in his office, and, and I had a fever of about, I think, 102, 103 I was running at that time. So he had me, my wife take me back to the hospital, and uh, they then admitted me. Libel is a man who enjoys spending time outdoors, but with the West Nile virus running rampant in his system, he wouldn't be enjoying this pastime anytime soon. Within a few days, he was far from his rural home, in an intensive care unit placed on a ventilator to help him breathe. After about a week in the hospital, Kent Libel was able to return home. I, I tried going back to work about a month later, and it was real difficult. I found myself literally trying to sneak off into the corner of the office and take a little nap or or go home. A lot of days I'd go home for half days. So it was uh, it was probably three to four months maybe before I yeah. felt like I function halfway decent. Libel says that today he thinks he has overcome most of the lingering effects of fatigue from his bout with West Nile virus. And his advice to the rest of us on how to avoid an experience like his is simple. The only thing they can do is protect themselves and and their family and uh, you know wear long sleeve shirts and and uh, try to get as good a protection as they can. So this is uh, a lot about West Nile. We've talked about that before and we haven't touched these other issues. I really like to ask you about bed bugs. I've heard that you're, now dogs are stiffing them out mm -hmm. and they're either freezing them or they're cooking them. Do you know anything about that? Oh, there's there's a lot of different treatments now that people are, are trying it. And you really have to, to tailor the treatment for the specific situation that, that you're dealing with. I, I, I was speaking this morning, in fact, with a woman in uh, South Dakota that uh, had a bed bug problem in an apartment. She's an 87 year old woman, yeah. darling woman to speak with. Yes. And uh, uh, we, we, we discussed her situation. And uh, there's insecticides of various sorts that can be sprayed, and they should always be, of course, use a commercial applicator who can. Who knows, uh, who's, what he's doing. Who's, knows what he's doing, has, has the various insecticides available, can tailor the application to the specific situation. There are heat treatments, there are cold treatments. Uh, and dogs? Dogs for sniffing them out. That uh, They haven't taught them how to lick them and 
and, and eat them. Carry them away, yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, but to sniff them out, yeah. yeah. And bed bugs have a very distinctive odor. So. Okay. There, there was an article in the papers a couple of weeks ago that very high class hotels are being affected mm -hmm. by bed bugs. Right. How, how can that be? Well, really, uh, there's there's no economic class that's immune from from bed bugs. Uh, um, the species that that we're primarily concerned about is the human bed bug, uh, but in some cases, uh, especially the high rise hotels, the upper floors actually have problems with with bird bed bugs that uh, move into the building when uh, uh, they vacate the nests. Uh, when, the, when the young have fledged and left the nest, and the, you have a, a like with swallows and pigeons and things, they'll they'll leave the nest, and you've got this nest full of hungry bed bugs in there. Move into they the, move into the hotel, so stay on the lower floor. Right. Um, but the human bed bug does get around, and uh, all it takes is is one uh, uh, pregnant female to hitch a ride, and uh, there and, you have it, and, and gets right we'll, in. Yep, that's it. And we'll, and we'll have to deal with that in another way, but I like the idea of dogs and not having to go with the insecticides, but you think that the insecticides are okay, safe? The, the newer insecticides are very safe. And they're effective? They're very effective, yes. Okay. Yes. Well, what about head lice and body lice? Now, I know that head lice are not dangerous. We just don't like them. No. Yeah, and yeah. body lice can carry typhus. I mean, they, part of the reason why uh, some say the North won the Civil War. And I thought I'd throw that in for you, Ken. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> the, the defeat of Napoleon is attributed to uh, typhus. Uh, typhus so. Which was from the body louse. From the body louse, yeah. yeah. They're, they're much more cuddly, but they do spread the typhus. So. Uh, chiggers uh, mm -hmm. really itch. And the whole mm -hmm. story was that they bury in, and the way you kill them is you put the clear nail polish. We've talked about this in other shows, but mm -hmm. explain the chigger story. Well, the, the nail polish uh, uh, might help a little bit with the itching symptoms, but it doesn't do anything for killing the chigger. Uh, the, the, the chiggers are the immature stages of, of what uh, are called uh, red velvet mites. And most people at garden have seen these. these. These are about two to three millimeters long, and they run through the garden in the soil, and they, they, they look like they're covered with red velvet. They've got all these thousands of little hairs over their body. Mm -hmm. But the immature stages feed on, on uh, uh, small mammals, rodents, uh, mice, and voles. Uh, and uh, when they uh, ma uh, mature into the second growth stage, they will climb up plants looking for an alternative host, and if a human walks through, um, get they'll, they'll get onto you, and then they'll uh, look for a meal. Uh, and so they're very, very tiny. You, so you, you never see that. You, you, you very it. rarely see them unless you're really looking for them. And then they'll burrow into the skin. They, they don't feed on blood. They actually feed on the skin. Um, but it's the saliva problem again. The, the enzymes from the saliva. The, and the allergy to uh, the, the spit. The, exactly. That, that causes the response. And the treatment is? Wait. Wait. And, there, yeah. and there's yeah. nothing to do to prevent yeah. it. How about mosquito repellent? Uh, well, mosquito repellent works to keep them off, but uh, you won't get 100% of them staying okay. away. So. All right. Any comments about chiggers, Ken? No. It can be, <clears throat> it can be a terribly difficult thing to have. Yeah. I think mostly little kids are the ones mm -hmm. who have it where, where we come from. And itch, 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 yeah. itch. So now, one of the problems with chiggers too is that during uh, their active season, pets can bring them indoors, and so you can pick them up as they come off the pet uh, into the house, and and then then you're really befuddled as to how you got them. So it was interesting. I heard that the one of the reasons that a petting dog developed through the ages is that if you uh, have a lap dog your body lice will jump on the dog and, and uh, jump off of you. Have you ever heard that one, Paul? I have heard that story. <laughs> I've never tried it, though. Oh. <laughs> and you have a lap dog. I have a lap But that's dog. not how you get rid of your fleas. No. no. Okay. No. And uh, I want to uh, talk about spiders in South Dakota, mm -hmm. Paul. Uh, what kind of spiders do we have here? And I would, I, what, what kind of dangerous spiders do we have in this? You, do you want an essay on all the spiders we have or just the ones that might be a problem? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, ones that bite. Okay. They're, actually, that list is very short. Um, uh, most spiders, well, all spiders are venomous. That They're predators. All spiders are predators. And so they always... They eat meat. They eat, well, they eat the juice of meats, yeah. Yeah. They um, go after bug meat, right. other bugs, uh, right, mostly. In, in our area, the vast majority of them, their mouth parts, the clissary, are just too small to, to break our skin. 
So they, they simply physically can't uh, do very much to us, even if they tried. Uh, and most spiders quite actually are very passive and they will not go into a defensive uh, a response unless you do something to them, like uh, put your hand on them or, or they get caught in like oh. under a sleeve or yeah. you know, the, the sheets of the bed, something. Um, the ones that, that are primarily problems here are, are the house spiders. Uh, and there's, there's several uh, species that go under that name, but the, the, the big ones form these, these uh, funnel webs. They're almost flat, but they form a little funnel as they go down into crevices, like in corners mm -hmm. of the room or uh, next to furniture, this sort of thing. And uh, uh, they're not particularly aggressive, but they can give a good bite and, and their mouth parts are big enough to penetrate the skin. For most people, it's, it's not a big deal, but you know, there is the occasional alert, uh, person that is allergic to them. Uh, we're, we are lucky in this regard. The only truly nasty spider we have up here is the black widow. And the number of black widow bites that we have uh, in South Dakota, they're very, very small. And it doesn't it do just primarily a toxin? I mean, it's just a, a, a it just causes an inflammatory response. Yeah. There. And that's it, it's not a big thing, it won't kill you. And, and uh, uh, recent studies have shown that uh, more than 50% of black widow bites are, with, are dry bites, that they don't uh, in, inject any venom when, uh, when they do bite. So okay. We, we, have, we have a lot of problems with the brown recluse mm -hmm. bite. Spider. And I think we have some here. I mean, I'm, my, my guess is because it's some classic brown recluse-like bites because I was trained in Georgia, saw the brown recluse. Yeah, yeah. Do the, we not have them? We, we have no verified populations of brown recluse in South Dakota. Okay. Uh, but it does uh, show up frequently during the summers, mostly on... Uh, Georgians uh, who come and visit. Uh, well, I was going <laughs> to... Wouldn't want to say Georgian specifically, but 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 freight uh, being moved up from oh, southern yeah. states, or or people moving household goods up, or yeah. you know, museum displays, you know, whatever might be uh, shipped up from the southern states. That Ken, I was going to ask you about brown recluse spiders in Georgia and that whole picture of what a, a brown recluse spider bite's all about. We see quite a lot of them. Uh, particular people who work in construction there, often under the houses. And <clears throat> it starts out as a very small bump. And over a period of about five days, it enlarges. It becomes very red, very painful, and in the center, it has an ulcer crater. A sore, an open uh, sore. An open draining sore. And it becomes quite large, and it's very difficult to treat. And you treat it with what? Antibodies. Yep. Give it heat? Appropriate. And heat and water and so forth. Whatever leads to some comfort. Right. Yeah. I had a patient who was working as a construction worker in an old house that had been abandoned for a period of time and suddenly had a severe bite pain. And then later that day, it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It was a very big sore. Mm -hmm. I mean, and an open ulcer as well. Uh, is that similar to the black widow spider bite? No, black widow uh, generally stays red, but uh, the area becomes generally inflamed, and you can have a lot of uh, uh, painful joint movement uh, in the vicinity of the bite. But it, it seems to go away after a day or two, slowly. But uh, but it's it, a, go. it's toxic. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I thought to, to and he said he thought it was a brown recluse. What other spiders can do that. There's another kind. Well, a actually, a lot of spider bites can uh, become infected, uh, usually uh, not from the bite or the venom itself, but, but from the scratching and the... And then you get a secondary staph infection. Exactly, or infection. exactly. Yeah. What, yeah. Why is this particular spider called a recluse? I thought all spiders were reclusive. Well, they are. Um, I. The brown recluse tends to be more active at night or in dark areas, and so uh, you generally don't see it out running around during the day or crawling around during the day. It's, so in, in that sense, it's, it's reclusive because it's night active. But it doesn't have to be those two in this uh, case. Uh, I had a, a woman who was a mail carrier. She said she saw spiders whenever she'd open the box and jumping around mm -hmm, inside, mm -hmm. and she felt that, and she thought she had a spider in her cloak that was on the seat beside her and then she had a bite and it just mm. it didn't want to go away. It's a good possibility. Yeah. Now what about a dancing spider, a jumping spider? Oh yeah, in what fact they're, they're very common in, in mailboxes. What are they called? Uh, jumping spiders, they're in the family uh, salticity which means 
jumpers. Jumping. <laughs> Jumping, yeah. Are they dangerous uh, or do oh, they bite? No, not really, no. There, there's some big ones that can get almost a, a, a five-eighths of an inch uh, in length, and they, they could probably give you a little nip if you land. But, <laughs> but they're really fun to play with because oh, they, they, are. they have very acute eyesight. Oh. Uh, and, and so you can actually play with them a little bit. You can sort of tap around and make them dance a little oh. bit because they're, <laughs> anything that moves, they follow. And, and, uh, um, it, well, remind me to yeah. do that next time I see a jumping spider. Um, I have a patient who had a sheep, was pretty sure, was a tick bite. Mm -hmm. And the tick bite swelled, and of course, it made me worry about um, the Lyme disease. Uh, and it could be a lot of other things like tularemia. So I treated with doxycycline. It covers a variety of uh, tick illnesses uh, spread by ticks. And it didn't get smaller. And we tried different antibiotics, and it didn't get better. It just There was a nodule, and it just stayed there. Ken, have you ever seen that happen? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I followed it for like six to 12 months, I think, and this little lady was 89 at the time. She lived to be 95. It didn't hurt her bad. I just had it excised by the surgeon mm -hmm. because I think there was a body part inside there. That oh, so there was a creature there. So Yeah, she yeah. had known of a creature. Let's talk a little bit more about flies. I mean, there are a lot of flies. I, mm -hmm. They're a hateful thing. Oh, tens of thousands of species of flies. Uh, so, I mean... Learn us about flies. We Mo all most of the flies are the great recyclers of the world. They, they come in second after the beetles, of course, okay. um, because most flies, their immature stages feed in decaying organic matter, plant material, animal material. Um, they're, they're some of the greatest soil builders that they are. They're, they're converting all of those, those dying tissues in, into the, the molecular structure by their feeding. And so our garden is full of fly larvae? Full of all over the place, yeah. And most of them you'll never notice that they're there, except for the occasional adult that, that will buzz around. Yeah. Um, they bite you? Most of them don't bite. Most of them don't bite. Most of them are flower feeders. They're going after nectar or dew, you know, they're pretty... Well, that sounds really sweet. It is, it is. <laughs> but but there, there are those, like the horse flies and the deer flies and, well, they're just and, and terrible. The, the, the biting gnats, uh, the buffalo gnats, black flies, uh, and again, it's the females, just like the mosquitoes. It's oh. the females that are taking the blood. <laughs> yes. Males are off, uh, you know, uh, ganging Nectar, together, feeding flowers. The, yeah, visiting the flowers. <laughs> you know. The flower children of the world are the f male flies. So. Okay, and so the, the females are the biters? The females are the what, biters. For their eggs, or is that it again? Yep, they're taking the blood meal in order to uh, properly uh, uh, produce their eggs. So. All right, any fly stories, Ken? No. Okay, I wanted to know about head lice. I think that a lot of people, you know, there's all sorts of things that you mm -hmm. can use to try to get rid of head lice. They're different than body lice. They mm -hmm. really don't carry any disease. They just make us feel bad. Uh, our kids come home with these things in their hair. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've heard that actually, and tell me if I'm right, that, you know, we've got these different things, rids and nicks and so on and so forth, but the very be best thing to get rid of head lice is the very fine comb. What's your comment about that? The, oh, and that is for removing the eggs, which are the nits. And so uh, those people that are old enough to know what the term nit picking means, uh, that's exactly what those combs are for, is you're, you're trying to get the, the nits out of your hair, the, the eggs. Um, my mother, who, who uh, was British, uh, used to, her joke was that if you wanted to get rid of head lice, you send a child to the army. Oh, and what happened there? Because they shaved the, oh, yeah. the hair off. So. <laughs> Well, we can't go any further without talking about bees a little bit. Uh, Ken, tell us about uh, what bees can do for humans or to humans. You can have anaphylactic shock uh, where a few minutes after the sting of a bee, your mouth swells, your lips swell, your posterior pharynx where you breathe becomes constricted and you cannot breathe. That's a very, very serious condition. Anaphylaxis meaning exactly what? I mean, it means that you are, have been previously sensitized to the toxin. And so you react just four plus when you're exposed to it again. Mm -hmm. Any comments about bees in our country? I mean, we've, they've been sick. Mm -hmm. Well, there's thousands of species of bees, uh, native ones that many of them can sting but don't cause a problem. Most people have a problem with just the common uh, European honeybee. 
uh, because that's the, the common one, especially around urban and developed areas, and that's what most people will uh, interact with. And so most of the, the bee sting problems and the anaphylaxis that Ken refers to is either from, from honeybee stings or from uh, uh, hornet or wasp stings. Hornets like yellow jackets and, and uh, wasps like the uh, paper wasps that build those little hanging paper uh, uh, nests from, from eaves. Who is not familiar with that whining, high-pitched mating sound of the invading female mosquito during our all-too-short summer months in the Midwest? After she finds the male, actually by matching tunes, she goes on a hunt for the blood of birds or animals in order to take a required meal so she can lay her eggs. When she finds skin, this tiny flying hypodermic syringe injects through her special needle nose some mosquito saliva to dissolve and lubricate so she can suck up the bloody food. As a matter of fairness, I might add here that the male mosquito is not bloodthirsty and is guilty only by association. But back to the biting. The trouble with this dangerous female, or femme fatale, all comes from her saliva. It is that salivary juice which causes the very itchy, raised, allergic welt which we hate so much. Since she only injects saliva and not blood from her previous victims, the mosquito does not spread diseases like hepatitis or HIV. On the other hand, when the mosquito ingests blood from an infected animal and that illness is of the type that can infect the mosquito itself, then we have a problem. She can spread from her infected saliva such horrid illnesses as malaria and filariasis, which are parasites. The saliva also can carry deadly viral illnesses such as dengue, yellow fever, equine encephalitis, and West Nile virus. Many of these mosquito-borne illnesses are in developing countries, and one could think out of sight, out of mind, but now we realize that we face several possible epidemics in this developed country, which are mosquito spread conditions. So use your mosquito repellent and keep away from that nasty mosquito saliva. Your responses to that particular comment or any other comments that you'd like to make about this topic, Ken? Mosquitoes, as you have just so presciently pointed out, spread huge amounts of disease. I was very intrigued, though, by what Paul had to say, that they do good also. Paul, comment. Well, uh, on the unfortunate side is that the, the problems that you mentioned about uh, increasing diseases uh, is related to uh, climate warming patterns that have been measured. On the lighter side, each species of mosquito has their own song. They sing their own tune to attract their own mates. They do. Mm -hmm. the, the songs are, are... Each species is different. And I've heard that they even harmonize. I mean, they, they have a particular tune that they can catch. When, when, you, when you get a mating swarm together, yes, they, they will... Uh, uh, what are the musicians how to refer to it? They're, they're all singing along to each other to attract the mates. So. The, I'd like to ask Paul something. Yes. And this is a good time to ask. Paul, there's a 12-year-old watching the show tonight, mm. who's trying to decide what he or she is going to spend the rest of their life doing. What do you get from entomology that would let you tell them that they should be an entomologist? In 10 seconds. Constant fascination. There's just so many species of insects out there from disease vectors to just plain beautiful creatures. Constant fascination. Well, it has been a pleasure, the two of you coming in, and Ken in particular, to fill the bill for our, our previously planned doctor who's delivering a baby right now. Thank you so much for, for doing this. And again, as always, it's a great pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you, Richard. Well, that closes the screen door on our show about bugs. I sincerely thank our studio guests for visiting with us about this sometimes creepy topic. Dr. Paul Johnson, research entomologist from South Dakota State University, and Dr. Ken Walker, neurologist from Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us, 
and let's stay unitchy out there. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Buback with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.